and welcome back to our study through the Gospel according to Mark. We're in chapter 14 this week in a couple different passages, so verses 32 through 42 and 53 through 65. So a little of this overlaps what we looked at last time, and then we build some new ground here also. And what we see in this first passage is that Jesus is praying in the garden. And I think there are three important things, at least, for us to take away from this. And the first is that this series of events described here is actually rather embarrassing. Jesus numerous times tells the disciples to pray. These are the guys that have walked with him, that he has counted on, and they fall asleep time after time after time. And yet they include this event, this failing for us in the Gospels for us to see. You are not going to make up that kind of thing and tell it to other people while trying to convince them that Jesus is God and that you're a religious authority to be trusted. No, people do not make up embarrassing details that make themselves look bad. So the fact that this is here just reaffirms time after time the trustworthiness of the scriptures, that they are the types of things they claim to be. But the second thing I want us to talk about is verse 36, where Jesus says, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup away from me. Yet not what I will, but what you will. This verse has caused much confusion over the years. Different kind of cults and different religions will point at this and say, see, Jesus wasn't truly God because he's disagreeing with the Father. Now, on the one hand, other religious groups have claimed that Jesus is the same as the Father. Exactly. There's no distinction. He's not a different person. He is the same person. And this, this verse here shows us that, no, there are two different persons in play here. In fact, there are three persons in our triune God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And if Jesus were not a separate person from the Father while still being truly God, he could not be talking to the Father. He's not talking to himself here. So that's the first thing is there are different persons in our triune God. But we must remember that Jesus is truly man and truly God. And so he has desires because he is a man and he has desires because he is God. But he is not a man in the same way that we are in one key difference. He is without sin. He's not in the line of Adam in that way. That's why the virgin birth was necessary. But he is truly man, truly God. He has desires because of his human nature and his divine nature. And as a man, he's saying here, he does not want to experience the pain of the cross. That's the cup he's talking about. That's a picture for the suffering that lies ahead of him. He knows what is coming. He's not just a victim of his circumstances. But he quickly follows that up by saying he does want to carry out the mission of his father. His will is not in opposition to the father's here. Does he want to experience the pain? No, it doesn't seem like he does. But on the other hand, does he want to flee the cross? No, he doesn't. He wants to carry out the will of his father. There's a submission to the will of his father, a submission that he exhibited when he first came to earth also. So that's the second thing I think that's important for us to work through in this passage. But the third is that Jesus devoted himself to prayer. If Jesus, truly God, needed to devote himself to prayer, then surely we do. And we are not facing circumstances like going to the cross to secure a people for the Father. We're not not being credited with the sins of the world. And yet Jesus committed himself to pray, even in light of his mission. So surely we need to do that too. Now, the next section of our passages today deal with the trials of Jesus, or at least the first trial. And there were two trials for Jesus. There's a religious trial that's going to take place in our passage today. And there's a civil trial that's going to take place. And we'll talk about why that is. But John's gospel tells us about the preliminary hearing that takes place before the trial we're going to see today. And we're not going to talk about that too much, but I just want to set the events there. Preliminary hearing, religious trial, and then civil trial. And there are a couple parts to that also. Now, the religious trial is in our passage, and then the civil trial is later. And the reason for this is, is because the Jews did not have unilateral authority to sentence someone to capital punishment. They could come up with a verdict, and we'll see them do that, but they did not have the authority to actually carry that out because they're under Roman rule. So that's why there are two trials here. And Mark is emphasizing in this passage just how rigged Jesus' trial is. It's late at night, and yet somehow they're able to find false witnesses. Like Mark is making the point here that the witnesses can't even agree. And somehow they were able to scrounge up witnesses after they snatched Jesus out of the garden late at night. But we've already seen in in, uh, chapter 14 in verse 1 that the verdict for this trial has been decided. It has told us that the religious leaders have decided that Jesus needs to die. So now they just have to figure out how to make it happen. This is the exact opposite of what justice should be. But we see here the witnesses can't agree. 
and uh, even in trying to have a miscarriage of justice, they are going to try and keep to the letter of the Old Testament law, which says that every event must be established by two or more witnesses. So they need two witnesses who can agree on the fabricated details. And here, once again, even in sentencing Jesus to death, we see Mark showing us that they are keeping to the letter of the law, at least in part, um, but obviously the heart of the law. They're, they're, they're miscarrying justice, something the Old Testament law would not have allowed for anyways, but trying to keep the pretense of conformity to it. And then in verse 58, um, this is one of the false charges that gets brought against Jesus. They say, we heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with hands, and in three days build another not made with hands. But that quote does not appear in the Gospels. And Mark tells us in the next verse that their testimony doesn't even agree on this point, which makes sense. If you're making stuff up, your testimony is not going to agree. And just as a side point, this is a good pointer and indicator for the trustworthiness of the Gospels. They are agreeing about the same events, even though they're told by different people. False testimony doesn't agree. True testimony does agree. That's another point for us. But they're making up this detail because Jesus didn't actually say what they said he said. Now, two years ago, before this event, he did say, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. But what he's really saying there, when we understand the grammar, he's saying, you destroy this temple and I will raise it again. But what was he talking about? He was talking about his body and the resurrection was the raising of the temple. But they misunderstood. And this misunderstanding about his death and resurrection is ultimately one of the things that's going to contribute to him being killed and then raising from the dead. And so they're, they're not having any luck convicting him on trumped up charges. And so finally, the, the chief priests and the leaders ask, are you the Christ, the son of the blessed one? And Jesus says, I am. And he goes on to even say more than this. And he links himself with the Son of Man, which is the messianic figure from Daniel, that prophetic book that we've talked about other times in Mark. This is the title Jesus likes to ascribe to himself, the Son of Man, the one who will come on the clouds, ushering in the kingdom of God. And after they hear this, they rip their clothes, which was a sign showing that they had heard blasphemy. And Mark tells us that they all condemned him as deserving death. They could not actually condemn him to death. That had to be done through a civil trial because they did not have that authority. But it's important for us to remember that Jesus' confession as Messiah led to him being executed as the Messiah, thus fulfilling his work as the Messiah. This is a way of fulfilling prophecy and Jesus' mission. But let's also remember that he did this knowingly and intentionally to secure our salvation and ultimately to glorify his Father.